Hi everyone, welcome to the start of another reading vlog. I am joined here by a rather grumpy Lola who I've just had to give a bath because she decided to roll around in something horrible when we were out on a walk, didn't you? Yeah, so now she kind of hates me. So she's just sitting <laughs> curled up in a blanket beside me. But I wanted to start another reading vlog today and I want to do another prize long list reading vlog. As I mentioned in the last one, some years I'm really into book prizes, some years I'm not, and this year apparently I am. I've already done vlogs reading the Barbellion long list, most of the women's prize, half of the International Booker Prize, and today I'm going to be reading, well not today, but over the course of this video, I'm going to be reading most of the Jalak long listed books. So the Jalak Prize celebrates work by British writers of colour, and I think also writers of colour who are residents of Britain, but maybe aren't British. So I have the long list open on my computer. What's really fun about this prize is that it brings together non-fiction, fiction and poetry. So there's a whole range of books within the long list itself. They also have a children's long list as well, but I'm gonna be focusing on the adult grown up one today. Two books that are on the long list are books that I've already read. So I've read Brown Baby by Nikesh Shukla, which is a non-fiction book written as a letter to his daughter, primarily talking about his love for his mother, but just in general reflecting on parenting and knowledge and inheritance and what you choose to tell your children and pass on and what you wish you had in turn asked your parent when they were alive. It's a really heartwarming lovely book and I listened to that one on audio which I would also recommend. I think I listened to that in October, November last year and then also towards the end of last year I read Honorifics by Cynthia Miller and this was the favourite, the favourite, my favourite poetry collection that I read last year. I think that it is superb. Her use of colour kind of gives me goosebumps and she has great lines in here such as thinking about pickling dark strips of stars and preserving them in vinegar. There are 12 long-listed books in total, and I'm gonna be talking about nine of them in this video, including the two that I have already read. So I'm reading seven in this reading vlog. So I already had four of the books, and then once the long list was announced, I decided to pick up another three. So the four I already had were Kayo Chigoni's collection, A Blood Condition. I adored his debut, which was called Kumakanda. I'll obviously be talking about these in more detail throughout the video as I read them. I'm also super excited to read Varney Capaldeo's new collection, which is called Like a Tree Walking. They are such a prolific poet. I think they have a book out every year. Uh, and not that I'm complaining, because I absolutely love their poetry. Then we've got Mona Arshi's novel, and she's also a poet. So this is called Somebody Loves You, and this is one I've been meaning to read for a while now. Likewise with this one, which is a short story collection by Huma Qureshi, and it's called Things We Do Not Tell The People We Love. Then when I saw the long list, I decided to purchase these three books. This is a non-fiction book called Consumed by Aretha Akbar, and this is a book about her sister who passed away after contracting tuberculosis and I think she travels to different places that remind her of her sister and then she writes about them. Then there's a crime novel that's been long listed. This is called The Khan by Simon Mir. This is a novel about a successful lawyer called Gia Khan who lives in London but I think she's from Bradford. The author herself is also from Bradford and then her father who in the north ran the local organized crime syndicate is murdered and she is called to take his place so that sounds really interesting and then i've also purchased this which is a graphic novel so not only do we have poetry novels and non-fiction but we also have graphic, well this is a graphic memoir actually, it's called The Roles We Play by Saba Khan. This is about British Pakistani diaspora and the illustration style in here is really delicate and really beautiful so I'm very much looking forward to reading that one as well and I will be talking about all of those books in this video but let me get the long list to quickly tell you about the three that I haven't picked up. The three books that I haven't picked up, at least not yet, we've got an essay collection by Kai Miller called Things I Have Withheld, a non-fiction book by Jeremy Atherton Lynn called Gay Bar, Why We Went Out, about the author's relationship with gay bars and the queer scene, and then we've got Keeping the House by Tisha Jim, which is a novel published by And Other Stories, which says it's a fresh and funny take on the machinery of the North London heroin trade. So those ones I haven't picked up yet, but I've got 
nine out of the 12. So I think that that means that I'm reading a good chunk of the long list. So let me start reading these books and I will come back to you when I have things to say. As usual in these vlogs, I will also be taking you on walks, showing you some cooking, um, all, all that usual stuff. And if you're new, my name is Jen. Hi, probably should have said that at the beginning, but I'm an author and a book reviewer. And if you would like to stick around, it will be lovely to have you. On to the books. Good morning, it's a couple of days later and can I be a stereotype and just talk about the weather for a second and also be a hyperbolic version of myself by saying for the umpteenth time that I really hope you can't hear the construction work very loudly. Soon we will be leaving, we will be leaving this place. We hope to exchange on our new place this week and I'm so excited because one, I, I love the new place that we're moving to and we've been planning this for, a long time but this construction work has been going on for over a month now and is set to continue for another four months so I'm just so glad that we're leaving anyway that was beside the point what was I going to say yes a stereotype and talk about the weather for a second it's so beautiful today it's so sunny and that clip that you just saw was from a walk I went on a couple of days ago and as I was walking home it was so bright and it was warm and then just suddenly it started snowing and hailing while still being sunny and warm and it was something dystopian and I, I didn't particularly like it but um, there we go we're here to talk about books though so should I talk about books probably um, so I have read two books from the pile of books I'm reading in this vlog I have read Somebody Loves You by Mona Arshi and I have read A Blood Condition by Kayo Chigoni Let's start with Mona's book. This is her debut novel, I think. She's written poetry before. I took one of her poetry collections off the shelf to show you. This is Dear Big Gods, which I really, really loved. And I enjoyed her novel too. I think I'm probably in the camp of people who are gonna prefer her poetry. And I would be interested to hear what everyone else thinks about that. Because for instance, I much prefer Ocean Fong's poetry to his um, novel on earth were briefly gorgeous which I appreciate is beautiful but I just love his poetry the most and I feel like I may be in the minority with that but I don't know if that's because fewer people read poetry in general I don't know if you've read both let me know anyway we're talking about Mona's book this is a book that reads very much like poetry if you handed this to me and I didn't know who had written it I could at least tell you that a poet had written this book and I would tell you that with a big grin on my face it reads almost like a series of prose poems about a girl called Ruby who has selective mutism and she's talking about a bad event that happened in her life and she's kind of circling around it, talking about her family life and the life outside of her home and it's tangled up in nature writing which means that the way that she ends up writing about her home feels like she's cocooned within it, almost like she is a caterpillar inside it going through it's morphing and she needs to conserve her energy for all of this reflection which is one of the reasons why she isn't talking right now in a chapter called speech this line really struck me it says here are a few things i have to say on the subject of human utterance the first thing you start doing when you start talking is editing that overwhelming feeling that if you open your mouth to say something it's just not going to come out right you're not going to give it the appropriate weight that you think it should have or maybe other people won't describe the weight that they should to what you're saying so all of that can feel extremely heavy and stop you speaking in the first place and i suppose there's a beautiful irony in that and that this is a whole book filled with words but ruby doesn't say very many of them it looks at the mental health of her mother in particular which is really poignant but as well as being very emotional in places it's also very funny in other places the dynamic between the two sisters in this book is funny there's this one scene where it's elevated out of a darkness so someone that they know has died and ruby saw her dead body it says i think she seemed dead my father looks towards me you saw her ruby didn't she look dead I nodded slowly and seriously, like I'm an expert on how a dead person should be. I can tell that my sister is really annoyed that I got there first and saw a real live dead body before she did. And that's never going to change, even if she sees a hundred more dead people now. 
I just thought that was a, a great representation of sisterhood. So yeah, if you like a beautiful language and you're not someone who is religiously tied to plot, then I would recommend it. I would especially recommend it if you are a fan of books like Reason She Goes to the Woods by Deborah K. Davies. It's definitely in that territory. Then I read Coyote Garnier's new collection. This is a blood condition. As I mentioned, I adored his first one, which was called Kumakanda. And like with Kumakanda, a blood condition plays around with lots of different kinds of sonnets. In a sequence of poems at the beginning of the collection, which is about HIV, the last line of each poem is the first line of the next one, which implies a communication, an inheritance, a carrying through, but also infection as well. I thought that was really effective. And something that Kayo does in these poems is use words to conjure up alternate possibilities, especially for places that he has been to and maybe can't rely on his memories of, like Zambia, which is where he's from. So the poems serve to create possibilities rather than specific nostalgia, which is what I would say Kamakanda is rooted in nostalgia. A blood condition definitely still looks backward as well, but is, is more forward focused and it still has that musicality that Kamakanda had as well, which I think is great. So I enjoyed both of these and we're off to a really good start. I'm not sure which book I'll pick up next, but when I do know, I will check in with you. I swear every spring I am surprised when I see baby rabbits on Hampstead Heath. It always feels like such a a surprise and, and it, well, it is a treat. Like it's a present. I don't know, nature's present. It's really cute. Um, and I especially find it odd because we go walking with Lola sometimes, who's my mum-in-law's dog, who you will have seen in those clips. And she doesn't seem to notice the rabbits. She is acutely aware of squirrels and other dogs, but for some reason, rabbits know. And she's half Jack Russell, so that really surprises me. I'm glad that she's not interested because it means the rabbits stay and don't run away and she doesn't chase them and stress them out. But I don't know, it just amuses me. Anyway. I've read another book. I had such a roller coaster ride <laughs> with this book. This is Things We Do Not Tell, The People We Love by Huma Qureshi. I read the first story and I really didn't like it. It is a short story collection. Um, it was a little bit too insular and it's very much tied up in memories and feelings of early 20 somethings. And for some reason, I'm just really not interested in reading about the will they, won't they misunderstandings in heterosexual relationships of young people. Um, I just, I just, it has to be a really special story to make me care. And I thought, oh no, I really don't, I'm not enjoying this. But then I read the rest of the collection and it's brilliant and I adored it. So I think I might need to go back to the first story and reread it and see if it was my brain at the time that I was reading it. It may well just be the subject matter, but I think what also surprised me is that often in short story collections, the strongest story is the first one. Um, I would do that myself when putting together short story collections. I put my strongest one at the beginning, second strongest second, third strongest last, and then kind of mix and match the rest. I mean, you want all of the stories to be strong, obviously, so it's not as if you're deliberately putting in weaker ones, but you have favorite things out of the things that you write. So 
my experience is if I don't love or enjoy, at least enjoy, the first story in a collection, it's probably a good indicator that I'm not gonna love the rest of the book. But I was proven very, very, very wrong with this. The second story in this collection is called Summer and I think it's one of the best short stories I've ever read. It's about a daughter who goes on holiday with her family and she invites her mum to come but she has this sinking feeling because every time she sees her mum she bigs it up in her head thinking this time it's going to be different and we're not going to argue and it's going to be fantastic and it just always comes crumbling down. So it has this sense of impending doom, this euphoric organization and optimism that you know is not going to last. It's so delicate and I think the title of this collection sums up the book so brilliantly because all of the stories are about the things that we are too hurt to say, too afraid to say because of rejection and oh it's just it's so so good. There's also an internal rhyming to a lot of these sentences, which means that these words really, really tumble. So here's an example of that. You almost spit your coffee out with laughter, and then you call yourself a spinster, somebody's mistress at best, but there's a sadness behind the way you say it, so then I don't ever bring up the subject again. One of the stories is about a friendship, which reminded me a little bit of one of the stories in Saba Sam's new collection, which is about this a friendship that you have with a whirlwind tornado of a person and you're trying to figure them out and you just grow further and further apart. I thought that that one was wonderful. There's another story about a daughter who's making jam with her mother and she's so frustrated with her mother that she wants to put a poisonous fruit in the jam and try and make her eat it. The descriptions of motherhood are exquisite. When Rafi was born, Shona was astonished by how thin he was. He was more pink than brown, new skinned and slippery like a fish in her hands. Sometimes she was so overwhelmed by the details of him, his violet eyelids, the waning crescent of his stomach, the constellation of smudged birthmarks that spanned the small of his soft back, that it brought tears to her eyes when she least expected it. She adored Raffi with a crushing force that sometimes frightened her. It wasn't a question of her love for him, it was only that there were other things about her too. She was terrified of falling through the cracks and that no one would even notice. It's the kind of book that makes you scream through the page of the other characters because you're so on the narrator's side, at least most of the time. And that kind of storytelling is really infectious because it makes you completely invested in what's going on. I'm going to come back to this collection many, many times. I think that a lot of these stories are as well as being wonderful to read, just great examples of what a short story can do and should be. So if you want to read a book about complex relationships and all of the unspoken things that just grow ghost-like the more you don't say them, then pick up a copy of this. I think this is probably one of the best books I've read so far this year. How exciting. Hi, it is the weekend. Mr M and I have been watching Stanley Tucci's Italy show and it has made me so hungry, especially for pasta. So I'm going to make pasta alla norma tonight and I think I'm also going to make some coffee cake, which is a separate thing, but I've got some mascarpone in the fridge that needs to be used. So I think I'm going to turn that into some kind of coffee icing and make a coffee cake. Basically, it's carb city in here and uh, I'm totally okay with that. So let's cook.
pals, I'm so excited. We are exchanging this week. We were gonna exchange last week. It's definitely happening this week. And that means that in about two weeks time, we're going to be moving. And as you can see, Mr. M may have got rather excited and started packing already. I haven't done that myself yet, but I have been organizing everything. There's obviously lots of things to do. I have reading vlogs scheduled, so there won't be any gaps when we're moving. At least I don't plan for there to be any gaps. Um, but one of the videos I may do is a sit down chatty video um, talking about recent favorites and doing a Q&A whilst packing. So I will put um, something on Instagram asking if you have any questions. You can um, put questions there, but also just for anyone who's not over there and has a question you would like me to answer in that video about books, reading, writing, life house, whatever, pop them in a comment down below and I'll answer as many as I can in that video. I don't quite believe that it's real. It won't feel real until we're in, but Oh, I've got everything crossed. I have everything crossed. All right, books, books, books. I would follow Varney Capaldeo's poetry to the ends of the earth. I just think that they're amazing. I first came across their poetry in 2016 when I was judging the Costa Prize and I read notes on expatriation and it was just one of my favorite books of the year. I just thought it was brilliant. I really enjoyed their collection, The Bear, as well. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, they're just so prolific. They bring out a poetry collection every year and this is their most recent one called Like a Tree Walking. Some of these poems are definitely lockdown poems and I mean, that sounds like a heading I wouldn't want near my own work because I think it's something we have the urge to recoil from, but I trust Varney with writing about these subjects. So they end up being collections of eco poems and comparing people to animals and talking about fairy tales. In fact, one of the lines is, what are the fairy tales we need and how to explain about going outside with a capital O, which was something that um, was very much on my mind when we were doing our forest walks at, at 5 a.m. And, and all of that stuff. So I just felt, I guess, open to this poetry and the directions that it was going in. And something that I admire about Varney's poetry is that they're not afraid to experiment a lot with space and, and movement, which may mean that you don't end up adoring every single poem in a book. I think that's always gonna be the case with the collection, but it has such a playful feeling to it. So the collection is saying, I'm just gonna do this for a bit. And you can either come with me and enjoy that, or you can just wait because I'll go back to what I was doing before in a second. I just want to have a bit of an experiment and I just really love that. That playfulness does extend into humor at times and it's the kind of humor that you might find in Ali Smith's books, the deliberate over the top wordplay, which is um, almost like, I guess like a dad joke in a poem, but you just really like it because it's surrounded by all of this serious stuff. Ooh, liken it. Moss follow the knowing path, leaf it, just leaf it. Spring green is crayon drawing on the curb. This sentence I underlined twice. Snow is a footnote. The layers to that? Oh, and I loved this line break in particular. For social dancing, read social distancing. So instead of social dancing, you could read, or you can take that a second way. For social dancing, read as in C, comma, social distancing. And the lines are even socially distanced by being parallel to each other and not touching. And I just think that there is a lot to dissect in this book and have fun with and be moved by. It's always a good sign when I've annotated a poetry collection as much as I have annotated this collection here. Um, one of my notes here says that these poems are full of sharp metaphors punctuating the flock um, because this is a poem about migration and birds but then it will have digs at immigration offices within it so it will catch you off guard and then it will swarm again. It's like watching a murmur of starlings, you know how they grow and expand and then come back together and just twist into all these amazing shapes. I love this book very, very much.
night. We are in the stairwell again, trying to escape construction noise. And I have finished reading The Roles We Play by Sabah Khan, which is a graphic memoir. And the Jalak Prize is shaping up to be the prize this year that has most consistently delivered books that I am loving, um, alongside the Barbellion Prize, which also had lots of fantastic books. I have enjoyed reading books from the Women's Prize longlist and the International Booker, but that's definitely been more hit and miss than this longlist has been, which is really exciting. So I very much enjoyed this memoir. Saba has trained as an architect and she looks at lots of different structures within this book. The book even feels like a building as though she's dismantling it to see how it stays up uh, and then discusses that. And then she's talking about other structures such as um, structures of family, but also wider structures like racism and colonialism and taking all of these things apart. So she says, why is a triangle the strongest shape in a building? But then if you look at a triangle in something like the structure of a family, maybe the mother and her two daughters, two sisters, that structure can sometimes be really fragile and doesn't hold everything up. So she feels almost disappointed, let down by the geometry of family structure and then outside of her family is let down by structures and labels that she's come to rely on so for instance she says to a group of people that she meets at university oh I'm Pakistani too and they say no you grew up here we're actually from Pakistan and she's grappling with all of these grey areas that other people may want to clearly define in unhelpful ways you know she's looking for the true spaces that she can inhabit and live in the spaces where she's free to talk about her family and how she loves them but also talk about the things that have been very detrimental to her and to her sister and likewise then also try and find out reasons for why her father perhaps behaves in a certain way and then link that in with colonialism and racism and diaspora there's a real kindness to this book when she's talking about people that she loves wanting to take care to really build their home and a picture of their home in the fairest way possible while staying true to herself at the same time. A lot of this book is about relationship between sisters and that seems to play quite a big part in the Jalak longlist which has been really fun because I feel like I don't read enough books about sisterhood and she follows uh, her sister's route when it comes to inheritance and culture and self-expression and compares it with her own and again links those threads back to their family life. One thing I will say about this which is not actually about the content is that the writing in it is really really small and I struggled with that as someone who has vision issues and I will say that's also the case for Kaio Chikoni's book as well. Some of the poems clearly had longer lines that would present incorrect line breaks if a larger font was used but I kind of wish that in that poetry collection it had done what other poetry collections sometimes do where they just have the poems on their side so you turn the page so that you have more space to work with. So maybe get this on ebook if you also struggle with reading smaller text. But um, that, that's kind of it. That's not really a criticism of the book itself, is it? That's just the printing, but I just wanted to flag it. I thought it was really good.
Hi, welcome to the final clip of the vlog. I want to upload this video today. So let me tell you about the final two books. I read Consumed by Aretha Akbar over the weekend. And I think that this may be my favorite book on the long list. And can someone please tell me why? When I really adore a book, I find it harder to talk about. I think it's because I want to do the book justice and I'm worried I won't and I have too many thoughts and they get stuck in my brain. But anyway, this book has lots of similarities with The Roles We Play by Saba Khan and reading them almost side by side was, was fascinating because they're both about complex sibling relationships and being second generation. So Arifa is writing about her sister Fauzia who died in 2016, she had TB. They didn't have a brilliant relationship or it was at least a very fraught relationship. And it's heartbreaking to read about that relationship with her knowing that that state is is always going to remain because she's gone now. There is a sentence that exemplifies that when she's talking about how her older sister is now going to become her younger sister because she is going to be older than the age she was when she died. And Fauzia was an artist and it's after she's died that Arifa looks at her art to try and see her sister and then likewise, she is writing about her sister. So exploring her sister through art. So it's this secular thing, this conversation that isn't a fluid conversation anymore because her sister isn't there, but it's still speaking across these mediums. And I will say content warning for eating disorders in this book. And the relationship between her and her sister with all its miscommunication is, is mirrored and paralleled in the relationship that her sister had with her doctors because they should have realized that she had tuberculosis, but they didn't. They ignored certain signs because of assumptions that they had made. And if that communication had been there, if they had tried harder, then this would have had an entirely different outcome. Arifa looks for her sister, not just in her sister's art, but also elsewhere. She looks for her in certain places that remind her of her sister. And she also looks for her within the history of tuberculosis. She buries herself in as much knowledge as she possibly can. I don't want to say too much about it, apart from encouraging you to pick it up. In places, it's very emotional and personal. And then in other places, almost as if a pushing back against that Arifa then looks at quite a few academic things um, to allow maybe herself to breathe and the book to breathe and then it will circle back again and I thought that that balancing of themes and emotions was just was really well done so um, if this sounds up your street definitely pick it up. Hi son. The light is better over here. So I haven't finished reading The Khan by Simon Mir which is the last book that I own from the long list but I will continue reading this off the vlog and I'll talk about it in my end of month wrap up. I'm 40 pages in and I'm finding it compelling. It's about a lawyer called Jia who lives in London and is called back to her family in Bradford after her father has been murdered or he's about to be murdered, it says that in the blurb. Her father is the leader of a local organized crime syndicate and I don't tend to read much about gangs. I did though enjoy The Glorious Heresies by Lisa McInerney when that was shortlisted and then won the Women's Prize in, was it 2016, 2017? I think I just on the whole tend not to enjoy books about organised crime when they're from the point of view of, of men within them. So I'm enjoying this perspective and as I said, finding it compelling, definitely wanting to pick it up and keep going but I don't have much to say about it because I've only read 40 pages so we will see how I get on with that. So a very successful reading vlog, reading seven of the books from the long list that I hadn't already read. The top favourites of mine, there were four of them, so there's Varney Capaldeo's Like a Tree Walking which was a poetry collection, Honorifics by Cynthia Miller which I'd already read before um, starting this vlog, so out of the nine that I've read I should say. Then Things We Do Not Tell The People We Love by Huma Qureshi, the short story collection, and then the non-fiction book Consumed by Aretha Akbar. All of these books are brilliant and so many of the other books I really enjoyed as well. I will list them in the description box if you missed any of the titles. I would love to know if you have read any of these books or if you're keen to pick any of them up. If you like this video and you're new to my channel I would love it if you could subscribe and if you enjoy the content on here and want to support me on Patreon that's also very kind. Link is in the description box too. I hope you're all having a good start to the week and I'll speak to you soon. Lots of love. Bye.